Hello, everybody. Welcome to another edition of The Orthodox Nationalist. This is Matthew Raphael Johnson. I want to thank my listeners and supporters who have assisted me financially. I encourage um, you to keep me on the air by going to my website, rushjournal.org, and um, donating to to the um, to this project and uh, all my research projects. One of which, by the way, has come to completion. The Barnes Review will be publishing a set of essays of mine, um, revisionist essays on the USSR. This is going to be um, very much original research, issues and questions uh, never before, um, even questions never before asked. Um, furthermore, finally, my book on Ukrainian nationalism from Mazeppa to today is uh, going to be going to press elsewhere. And I'll keep you updated on that. Um, but today, um, it's it's a depressing day because over the last few weeks, as no doubt you've heard, the um, shell of the Church of Rome canonized a character by the name of Oscar Romero. I remember him very well. Uh, I was just a kid when this happened. And... Um, he was the Archbishop of, of San Salvador, in El Salvador. And in 1980, he was uh, gunned down, uh, allegedly after his homily, uh, at a hospital chapel somewhere. Um, and he's been called a martyr for the faith. Now, problems there are many. He was a Marxist. He was a liberation theologian. Uh, and, uh, considering this man a, um, martyr, now enshrines Marxism and, and, and that, that kind of, uh, materialist socialism, uh, terrorist socialism, socialism, as you found in El Salvador, during the El Salvadorian Civil War, as official part of Roman Catholic doctrine. Uh, you know, it, it's, trying to pick what the worst, most ridiculous thing that, that this Francis character has done is hard, but this may be it. Uh, Roman Catholics are converting in large numbers, um, but this really is is the last straw. And I, I talk about this with some vehemence. I've spoken about it before, because when I started college, um, when I was active in, in Catholic courses on campus early on, um, this was a huge issue. Then in 1992, uh, Dubois uh, died of cancer, and he was a right-wing leader, the leader of the Arena Party, and so it reopened all those wounds. And so it was a huge issue of mine, and probably the very first foreign issue I ever tackled as a as a student, and the only one defending the right-wing, more or less right-wing government. Uh, of El Salvador throughout the 1980s. Now, there is nothing out there that you have to search in highly specialized places to find anything negative about the communist guerrillas that tormented the country and anything positive about the government, whether military or civilian, in the 1980s in El Salvador. There is absolutely nothing that questions the official narrative. And now you have the Church of Rome canonizing this Marxist as a martyr for the faith. The uh, leftist revolutionaries in El Salvador were financed by Cuba, um, the Soviet Union via Cuba. The leaders of the FMLN were traveling uh, different Marxist states throughout the globe, uh, raising money and bringing in weapons. You know, essentially, was it was a global conflict in this little country, um, and they would have created a Cuban gulag in this country. And yet, those who, like this Jesuit, who who would have um, supported that, gunned down as essentially a combatant by what we think, I guess, most people think, right wingers. Um, you know, those are the rapid response, the battalion, etc. 
Um, those are the men who actually are defending the faith, not this character. And what's happened in this ridiculous canonization and the lies being told about this man um, were front page news, I guess, for a few days. And among Catholics, it's, you know, I mean, it, it, being Catholic is hard enough, but being Novus Ordo, it, there's no excuse for it anymore. To be Novus Ordo Roman Catholic and be intellectually honest is simply impossible. And this is just one of a thousand issues. We dealt with Fatima before, and this is another matter. Now, I, I um, you know, right after I did Fatima, I think it, it, this, this broke. It had been going on for some time. There were, you know, there were the, the, the lies that were being told about him. Um, and to have the Church of Rome now put its stamp on Marxism, which is what this man absolutely was, contrary to all of the mystification that surrounds him. Well, we'll get into this detail here right now, but it really is something that, that, um, is very disturbing. Given the fact that there is nothing um, truthful on the civil war in El Salvador, I had to do all the digging, as always. Um, and in fact, I, I need to do a paper on the myths and lies told about uh, Latin American military governments. Um, the U.S. did not support them. Uh, they were extremely um, active in social reform, far more so than any civilian government was. This, this has been the case all over the place. Um, the fact of the matter is now, the literature in English, with almost no exception, and it's very large literature, on El Salvador in the Civil War in the 80s is absolutely unreliable. There's nothing reliable there. You have absolutely maudlin, uh, romanticized treatments of the uh, Farabundu Marti National Liberation Front, which is the FMLN, and then these very Hollywood-style denunciations of the government. Both military and civilian governments ruled El Salvador throughout the 1980s. Uh, although most of the time it was an elected government. But El Salvador and Nicaragua were two civil wars that absolutely dominated American politics in the 80s, and liberation theology was essential to both. So as the Roman Catholics are fighting for their lives in places like Hungary and Poland under the communists, these characters are um, inviting the exact same system to be imposed on them. Um, liberation theology, and I've read a lot of the initial material, um, the, the confusion is, well, let me put it this way. It, it was the way that the left was able to infiltrate the church in Latin America. I mean, both the Church of Rome and the Orthodox Church, um, prior to, of course, modernity, uh, post-modernity, fought capitalism and inequality and, and poverty uh, in every way humanly possible. So saying that this is your focus doesn't make any sense. This was a different situation entirely. They took what was a legitimate critique of capitalism, which, of course, was not even the case in Latin America, and then, without really telling anybody, connected it to, to Karl Marx. Despite there being dozens of great thinkers in the Christian socialist tradition prior to Marx, and even after Marx, no, it was Marx and communism that motivated these guys. Christian socialism and liberation theology have nothing in common. Christian socialists do believe in, in private property, in the yeoman sense, we're not talking about capital here, and communal structures based on local tradition, Liberation theology seeks a Marxist collective established by violence. So for those who are uneducated in this field, it's very easy for one to be confused for the other because both uh, oppose capitalism, but they couldn't be any more different. Capitalism and oligarchy go together, and they are evils that are a part of the modern world's apostasy. But Leninism long proved itself incapable and uninterested, uninterested in any kind of social justice and condemned the whole notion of workers' rights. Which, by the way, in my USSR book, I go into great detail explaining that the last thing that the Soviets ever cared about was labor. One of the big reasons they broke with Tito in Yugoslavia is that he was actually putting workers in charge of factories. He almost was invaded over that. It was never an answer to modern problems. It was never meant to be. To canonize Romero is to canonize Karl Marx. There's no getting out of this at this point. Now, the leftist official 
neoconservative, neoliberal, socialist, communist, Roman Catholic uh, narrative is simple. They use Johnson's law and they say El Salvador was a landed oligarchy controlled by a handful of families. These families were politically uniform. They all supported right-wing causes. The state and the army, etc. were all creations of this elite. The U.S. government in supporting the, the government in San Salvador um, was propping up oligarchy. There was no ideological um, issue beyond that. And that the peasants spontaneously amassed piles of weaponry, spontaneously organized themselves into highly trained cadres, and fought the government pretty much to a standstill throughout the 80s. The official length of time for the Civil War is 1979 to 1992, but the fighting you know, was far earlier than, than 79 too. Initially, the, the FPL was the uh, largest of the, of the Leninist groups, and they operated through terrorism, um, assassination, robberies, uh, high-profile kidnapping, and extortion. In the late 70s and very early 80s, that was their way of, of raising money. Today, El Salvador is one of the most criminally uh, um, um, absolutely chaotic societies in, in all of Latin America. And it's because of how the left funded itself throughout the Civil War. Um, in May 1977, Mauricio uh, Bugnova was a powerful Salvadorian elite was, was kidnapped for ransom by the FPL. Now, the FPL uh, often wore army uniforms and they often spoke deliberately in military-style jargon. They weren't, of course. They were communist guerrillas. The Soviets did this uh, when they when they fought peasant uprisings in the in the um, late twenties and early thirties, uh, wearing the the uniforms of the local Cossacks or, or whatever group was fighting them. Um, no no rational or, or decent person fights this way. It's pure deceit. And in fact, the rules of war don't apply to these people, taken very seriously. But the point was to throw investigators off the trail. Now, the FPL claimed credit for this abduction, but in the press, the somehow the military was involved. Now, the Popular Revolutionary Bloc was kind of the front organization of some of these. And the base of operations was the Central American University, a Jesuit institution, that was absolutely essential, both in Nicaragua and El Salvador, for liberation theology's development. Ignacio um, Elicuria, killed during the Civil War. Um, Segundo Montes, Ignacio Martin, Don Sorbino, all of these were Jesuit Marxists. And by the way, materialism is fully consonant with the Jesuit order. My former bishop, uh, uh, John Lebu, was a Jesuit, and he says, yes, they're atheists. He knows them extremely well. Um, so when these guys were gunned down, they were gunned down as combatants. They were gunned down as subversives. They were gunned down as extremely dangerous men. They weren't uh, innocent clergy ministering to the people. This was an elite, very expensive university. The last thing they cared about was the people. But then the left created this notion that Christianity is being persecuted by the government in El Salvador. One of the ways that the left operates, and they do this with Hitler, they do this with a lot of people. If they don't like a more or less right-wing organization, and they really don't like them, we already know there's plenty of reasons for the left not to like them. But the regime wants to give the right reasons not to like them. So the whole thing, Hitler was a pagan kind of thing. Um, or that the, the, um, you know, uh, pictures of skinheads burning the American flag and stuff like that. The point was to make sure that the right wing doesn't get any more radical. That, that Rubicon is, is guarded like the DMZ in Korea. Um, and making a right wing government seem 
odious to right wingers is extremely important to the press. So in shooting these communists, the fact they were wearing clerical collars means nothing to, to me. Um, um, but these were, these were, um, these were communist intellectuals. They were activists. And of course, guns were found all over them. They were running guns for the FMLN. They were legitimate military targets, as far as I'm concerned. But the notion that Christianity was being persecuted by the right-wing government in El Salvador was a way to get right-wingers. Remember, Reagan is going to be elected here in a minute to, um, to reject this government as well. It's a tiny little country, but it's very strategic. And both the Soviets and the Cubans thought that this was really the linchpin to collapsing all of uh, Latin America. Um, the FPL um, and the BPR, these you know the, the militant group and then the legal political party, were run by the same people. Uh, the National University of El Salvador, as well as the CAU, as I mentioned before, these universities were absolutely essential to Marxist ideology. The Jesuit University that I mentioned before. Um, Created no, no, no fear. The, the Central American University, which is a private Jesuit school, created n- no fewer than three Leninist organizations. It was founded as a communist base of operations. That was its purpose. Um, but then the left, the, the Leninist revolutionaries created something called the DRU, the Unified Revolutionary Directorate. And this was the propaganda arm. Um, people like uh, Shafiq Kandal, uh, Joachim Villalobos, um, these people were charged with traveling, going to the Soviets, going to Czechoslovakia, wherever they needed to go, including the United States, to get money, universities, uh, money, weapons, everything else. Uh, the border with Honduras was unpopulated, and that was really the drop point for, uh, for weapons drops. Um, and the DRU was formed largely because the communists knew that if the peasants knew what they were all about, they wouldn't support them. You know, the communists were going into villages, just, just like the, you know, the left did throughout the 19th century in Russia. They go to the village and lie about what they want. We want to give land to you. We want to give you know, the land was theirs anyway, but we want to give this land to you. And, um, they were very out of touch people. They dressed in what they thought was peasant garb and they looked ridiculous. Um, you know, they spoke like, you know, arrogant Jewish urbanites talking down to these people. And they failed, of course, miserably. But this is similar. The DRU is worried that peasants can't learn what we really are. Just because they're Jesuits doesn't mean that they're Christians. Um, the DRU was a propaganda arm. Um, and, uh, the F, the FDR, the Democratic Revolutionary Front, uh, was more the, the political wing, which had the same purpose. The FDR was a way to, they created these little tiny parties that had like 10 people in them. And then went to the American press and said, you see, this is our, this is our movement. See, it's not Marxist. We have all kinds of groups here. You know, the party that loves justice and stupid names like that. You know, and they had, you know, 10 people in them and, and it was all the same leaders. Uh, it was a way to hide their identity. The truth of the matter, of course, well, that, so that narrative of, you know, the spontaneous organization, this is all utter nonsense. It's true that El Salvador was an oligarchy, a landed oligarchy. Problem is, the FDR was financed by one of them, as always, the Salvadorian multimillionaire named Enrique Cordoba. And he was not the only one. The FDR made Cordoba its first president. Um, Julian Otero, uh, who was a defector from the group, claimed that the oligarchs backed the left in far greater measure than anyone had realized before. Frankly, you know, a well-organized, well-armed, well-led, well-fed guerrilla insurgency is never spontaneous. This is ridiculous. Now, the Catholic Church in El Salvador um, had a very liberal hierarchy, but the priests at the local level were, were conservative, as, as you might expect. Um, the bishop that succeeded Romero after he was shot, uh, Rivera, uh, uh, Rivera de Mas, was a liberal, certainly, but he did denounce the communists, something that Romero wouldn't do. Damas said that the church does not support this insurrection, and he said that the Salvadorian left had been dishonest. 
claiming to be a popular movement, when in fact it wasn't. They created a, a people's church. This happens everywhere, like the living church in the Soviet Union. Uh, it was formed by the DRU and, and the FDR to essentially penetrate the parishes and the seminaries. Um, and of course, Dumas, um, Damas, excuse me, uh, condemned this organization completely. Yet they claimed Romero was a member. I don't know if he was, but they claimed. 1980, the communists began a massive military offensive to establish what they call the people's democracy. Uh, the penetration of the church, many leaders, uh, Jacinto Sanchez, for example, said this was a major goal to use liberation theology to get the churches on our side. Um, in fact, it was just as important as the military operation itself. They wore Salvadorian military uniforms quite often. And just like in, you know, during the Russian Civil War, and the left has been doing this for a long time, they dress in military uniforms and they commit crimes. Again, that means that these guys are not granted protection under international law. Guerrilla armies have to wear a uniform that distinguishes them from civilians and the government. This is very explicit. This is why so many of the of the killings in, in the Vietnam War were legitimate, because they refused to wear uniforms. If they refuse to make a distinction between civilians and fighters, and civilians get killed, it's not the fault of the government, it's the fault of the rebellion, or of the guerrillas. Um, any dead body after a firefight was pictured and explained to the Western press as a victim of death squads. The FMLN would strip bodies of any identifying features like uniforms, and you wouldn't be able to tell who they were. Accurate figures are simply impossible. There's a list of massacres that the government uh, allegedly carried out. Uh, There's absolutely no way, just like in Srebrenica and elsewhere, you can't tell if these are combatants or not. They could be young, doesn't mean they're not combatants. They could be female, doesn't mean they're not combatants. They could be Jesuits, doesn't mean they're not combatants. Over and over again, the FMLN, which is, you know, that's, you know, by 1980, the FMLN had taken over from these other groups and became the Cuban sponsored umbrella organization for the Leninist movement, uh, in El Salvador. Um, and yet in 1982, the church did say that the FMLN were responsible for the riding, rising tide of violence as the Civil War got nastier and nastier. During the same period of time, 57 members of the security forces were arrested for crimes in combat. The defense minister, uh, General Garcia, made it clear to the army that if any crimes were committed, American aid would be cut off. They had a very firm incentive to control their anger in wartime. Unfortunately, the FMLN didn't. From 1979 to 1982, over 400 members of the military had been removed uh, from his conduct, which is saying a lot when you have an army of, you know, 12,000. Um, so the, the press would talk about, you know, people being gunned down by those wearing Salvadorian military uniform. And the next day they said the army did it. Um, now, the day before, two right-wing priests in the village were killed by an FMLN death squad and got zero media attention. Hugo Vey, which who was uh, part of the S- Swiss diplomatic mission, was gunned down by the FMLN in May of 1979. And despite the communists claiming responsibility for this, the media said that the crime had never been resolved. And the army, in fact, because they had been threatened by the United States, um, that any kind of criminality in combat would mean a disruption of aid, the um, upper ranks were extremely careful with their with their soldiers. Of course, in, in combat, bad things are going to happen. That's not the issue. The left says openly now, and either right does too, and the Catholics do too, that the government had no legitimacy. Everything they do is 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 murder. Uh, all their operations are death squads, and uh, the left were more or less pristine. Except there's a few bad apples, but that's about it. The propaganda, as always, is repackaged as news by the American press. The uh, FDR explicitly stated that their agenda was to misrepresent both the government and American policies and actions, and to foster the impression of overwhelming popular support for the revolutionary movement. 
It was the FDR uh, PR operation that coined the term death squad. There were no such entities in the Salvadorian army. The death squad refers to um, the anti-insurgency or the counter-insurgency battalions formed in the heat of the civil war by uh, the army. Every government has these. Uh, a death squad refers only to rapid response counterinsurgency battalions. There were there were no death squads. There were nothing like this. Um, it was a civil war. Anything the government did was, and of course, death squads. So when the FMLN gunned down all kinds of people, including American military, um, a whole bunch of American military were killed by the FMLN. And they got zero media attention. That was not considered the actions of a left-wing death squad. So that... That was part of the PR campaign from uh, Cuba, from the Church of Rome, from um, um, from the uh, FDR and all these other, you know, the, the universities, the Jesuits, to create this this notion of of um, criminality. So when you hear the word phrase "death squad" being used, it is part of a PR campaign. They didn't exist. Um, the, the man in charge of, of weapons procurement, Shafi Kandal, um, there were many, you know, first of all, you have a lot of uh, retranslated, uh, KGB documents under the Yeltsin administration has been, have been released that show the government's position was correct. And of course, um, document caches that are, that were captured by the, the U.S., um, one of which clearly show that Sfi Kandal made trips to Cuba, Nicaragua, East Germany, Bulgaria, Vietnam, and the Soviet Union to procure money and weapons. But the weapons they wanted of Western providence. See, if they use AK-47s, it would make it too, too easy to distinguish between left and right in the battlefield. The media to this very day denies any foreign support for the guerrillas. They never, they never ask where their very impressive store of weapons come from. But they use M16s, not AK-47s. Now, the, some of the captured documents generally suggest the, uh, there's a U.S. Uh, State Department document called uh, FDR, FERN communication from 1981 that revealed that the Honduran security forces uncovered an arms infiltration operation run by Salvadorians working via Nicaragua and directed by Cuba. The weapons included 100 American-made M16s, 81-millimeter uh, mortar ammunition, and these arms came from Vietnam, which is very curious. Well, they trace the serial numbers, and these were weapons that were sent to the Americans and the South Vietnamese um, at near the end of the Vietnam War, and they were either captured or just left behind. In fact, the Americans and the AVRN uh, left quite a bit of, of American-made weapons laying around. Because of the nature of the Civil War, the FMLN wanted to use weapons that the government would use. Using AK-47s would make it easy to trace them. They wanted to use M-16s so that they could say, the government did this, the death squads did this. Um, there were many seizures of these caches. Uh, a plane carrying uh, munitions was captured. The pilot was a, um, this is in 1981, uh, Nicaraguan government employee admitted flying two earlier arms deliveries to El Salvador on behalf of Cuba. So this is conclusive evidence that the leftists were receiving money from abroad, receiving weapons from abroad of Western background, and that they had done a good job of fooling the very gullible Western press and very naive bishops like Oscar Romero. So by 1980, between 1980 and 1982, the violence in El Salvador, the war um, had convulsed the country. The thing is, the military government which in 1984 was replaced by a civilian government, the military government had an extremely radical um, land reform program that the left made impossible to implement. The point is, the FMLN created chaos on purpose. They would create chaos, and then they would point to the chaos that they created as a reason that the government should, should go. But once the, once, um, the, the government fell in Nicaragua, that gave the Soviets the idea that maybe violent revolution will work all throughout Latin America. So the DRU was was um, 
said that there, we, we cannot have a political solution to these problems. Part of the reason for that, of course, was that they did very poorly at the polls, so they condemned any attempt at engaging in elections. The, whether it be military or civilian governments, um, even the Church of Rome was involved in attempting to create dialogue between the FMLN, the FDR, and the government. Uh, it's true that the, the, um, the international press referred to the FMLN as moderates. Um, and the FMLN lied about its agenda. But, um, because they were clobbered in the polls, they called for election boycotts. And the problem was that the military government, as is the case with all military governments, was more than anybody else wanted to break the power of the oligarchs in El Salvador. Now, the press said that the U.S. backed the Arena Party, which is the so-called far-right party at the time. They didn't. They backed Napoleon Duarte. Duarte was president from 1984 to 1989, although... The Arena Party dominated the legislature, and they dominated um, uh, local government bodies. Prior to 1984, you had a very unstable group of three military governments that came and went. But as they progressed, they became a bit more radical. They were the ones, the military were the ones, because they had the ability to go over the heads of oligarchs um, to build a very substantial land reform program that Duarte was uh, going to implement. Uh, unfortunately, Duarte, being a moderate, an actual moderate, found himself losing control um, from, from the right on the one hand and the left on the other. He met with the FMLA trying to come to a negotiated solution. Well, the FMLA deliberately made demands that they knew could, they could never get. First demand, the abolition of the army. The second demand, the abolition of the arena party. When I say the abolition of the army, what I mean is they wanted the FMLN to be integrated with the security services and a whole bunch of guys to be forcibly retired. Well, a lot of the propaganda here uh, caused the Congress to, and for very bad reporting, caused Congress to put conditions on aid to El Salvador. The land reform program came from the military, not from the Congress. But they demanded um, an election plan for 1982, for the legislature, and then a year later, a presidential election. That's what the U.S. supported uh, with its aid. So Duarte, uh, I'm sorry, the, the uh, military created the Central Electoral Council, uh, Jorge Bustamante, uh, who was the head of that, invited all Salvadorian political groups, including the Marxists, to participate in elections. But the problem for the FMLN is that if they lost, it would expose their lack of popularity. Um, the juntas that had come to power in the late 70s and very early 80s, um, they confronted a situation where the FMLN had unlimited international support, and the press, as is so often the case, acted as their PR firm. Because of this, and because of the victory in Nicaragua, they refused all offers of cooperation. But the third junta in the early 80s was made up of, of younger officers. These guys, you see this in Greece, and Syria, everywhere, they uh, decreed uh, a sweeping uh, land reform program. They expropriated all holdings above 500 hectares. They nationalized commercial banks. In the Sandinistas, they never even tried to do that. The new government was committed to reform. But the FMLN now goes into a panic because their issues are being co-opted. No one made mention of this substantial land reform program. The military governments of the late 70s and very early 80s were far more successful in breaking the oligarchy than the failed Sandinista government was. What could be Spain, to Syria, to Burma, to Greece, to El Salvador, military governments were successful in going over the heads of elites to permit the growth of a healthy smallholder economy. The problem is, Leninists are opposed to private property in general. So now their lives are being exposed. They declared war on those who were involved in the land reform program. Now, 
the um, second junta under um, Carlos Romero, no relation to Oscar, renounced American assistance. That was back in 1977. He did this because he saw the U.S. essentially as a, a pro-leftist uh, movement. Um, the third junta removed over 100 conservative senior officers, which, again, for a small army, crippled them. Um, Romero was overthrown. The U.S. resumed its assistance. And um, both the third junta, as well as the election of um, Duarte in 1984, there was a clear, fairly radical plan of land reform starting in 19, March of 1980. Um, phase three was the so-called Land to the Tillers Law of April 28th of 1980, which granted legal title to smallholders. And of course, that was preceded by phase two, which was the expropriation of all holdings between 100 and 500 hectares, decreed in um, March, uh, a month earlier, 1980. Now, the government said the lack of administrative and financial resources for its, for its, um, problems with implementation. Well, there's a civil war going on. They were offering the most radical land reform program in Central America. There was no elite oligarchy holding on to its privileges. In fact, the AFL CIO was working with the government to implement these reforms. The press was not talking about this at all. In the 14th Congress of the AFL-CIO, they condemned the flow of Soviet weapons. Uh, the, the federal education budget of 1981 in El Salvador was the highest in their history. The fact is, is that the military government was building public trust. And the FPL and all these other Leninist groups went into a panic. They began attacking peasants as they received their land. This is why they wore government uniforms. Now, they took credit for it sometime later. Um, communist attacks on these people. The communists had much more to, to lose. All factions in Salvadoran politics said that the oligarchy has to be broken. All factions said that. The communists had an interest in stopping this because it was taking their main issue away. The military government was doing what they were promising. And, of course, the FMLN rejecting private property, really had no intention of doing this in the first place. Now, by 1982, the American Congress uh, voted to um, require certification. Every six months, they had to report onto their progress uh, uh, curbing abuses by the armed forces in a civil war. Um, and the administration accepted this. And the government emphasized economic growth in the faith of these endless guerrilla attacks on the infrastructure of the country. They were an impossible situation. Um, the military, as it turns out, was far more radical than the FMLN was when it comes to land reform. They even offered amnesty to its opponents. So long as these opponents lay down their, their weapons. But because of the communist insurgency, law enforcement, and the implementation of these land reform programs broke down. So you can see the irony here. Now, even the electoral laws were very... Anybody with, with 3,000 or more signatures can form a party and run for president. Even the military would, would permit the registration of communists if they, you know, weren't part of the uh, armed organization. I'm pretty sure that Castro would not have permitted Batista's forces to, to organize. The FMLN called for a full election boycott. They did it because they knew they would lose. It was hard for any leftists to run for office because the FMLN had decreed death for anyone who was seen to be cooperative with the elections. In 1982, the church backed this process. In fact, there was a special appeal from Rome to be a part of the electoral process to stop the war. Now, what the FMLN did was demand power before the elections. In other words, they said that, that the present government, um, the present military government, of course, can't oversee fair elections, even though, in essence, the U.S. would be overseeing. So they demanded power and the banning of the arena party before they would consent to elections. <laughs> 
In other words, they wanted a victory before the election so they could run them. The government had had, had proclaimed um, essentially unconditional amnesty. Although anyone who laid down his arm, arms and, and became a part of the process was usually gunned down. Commander Carpio, one of the military heads of the FMLN, said this, to participate in these elections is to support the junta. That's a warning to the voters. He said, we insist you not participate in these elections. We will be watching your future behavior, revolution or death. The armed people will win. And on January 21st, the group promised to increase its harassment of participating parties throughout the year. Um, Carpio, though, did let it slip that they could count on maybe 20% of the vote. Um, Guillermo uh, Ergo, um, who had been also a guerrilla leader in the 70s, he got 6% in his presidential run in 1971. He abandoned the left and he became, um, he, he ran with Duarte in, 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 as vice president in 1972. So when Duarte was elected in 1984, he inherited this fairly radical agenda from the military. So he declared a state of emergency, immediately condemned by the U.S. This is a civil war going on, by the way. He engaged in every conceivable way. Uh, public works, educational investment, irrigation projects, crop price supports, everything. Unreported in the American press. But the left was about taking power, centralizing power, destroying private property, putting it all in the hands of the state, and therefore to have a military government or now an elected, legitimate, um, democratically legitimate civilian government doing what they were promising to do caused a crisis of conscience with these people. And this is where the violence came from. Now, Archbishop Romero was gunned down on March 21st, 1980. This is who Francis uh, canonized. He said in his regular um, homilies over the radio, he said, well, he claimed to be appalled by the brutality employed with increasing frequency by government forces against the population and particularly against the clergy. Well, either through ignorance or through PR or whatever, um, you know, clergy, well, he's referring to communist Jesuits. Not priests in the village. The FMLN was killing those. He says nothing about that, though. Um, he claimed that excesses committed by the military were the sole source of violence, or at least non-combatant violence in the country. He's getting these, of course, from Western newspapers, who themselves are getting it from Central American University or the DRU. Then he demanded that soldiers not carry out orders. That irresponsible and suicidal frame of mind made him a legitimate target. This is why he was gunned down. He was the Archbishop of San Salvador, the head of the church in the country. He had used his influence to urge parties to pull out of the out of the junta and argue against U.S. military aid. He was against the election, election process. He was the most powerful figure advocating for the dissolution of the state and the broadening of the Civil War as a result. He was naive. He was absolutely bizarre. And had his wishes been carried out, the war would have become far more violent. And the Soviets would have taken over the country and, who knows, shoved them in a gulag somewhere. He became an enemy combatant at that point, far more dangerous than the FMLN punk with a rifle. In fact, his own propaganda bore fruit in January of 1981, emboldened by this kind of thing. And after Romero and the Jesuits were gunned down, with unlimited international support, they started a massive offensive. They lost. It was a complete disaster. They began believing their own propaganda. They underestimated the popularity of the government, the cohesion of the military, and importantly, that offensive demonstrated how little support these leftists had among the peasant population. The whole concept was, they had this romanticized idea that they were getting from the Cubans, 
you um, start this insurrection, and then the people will be following with pitchforks behind you. Well, this nationwide insurrection that they had counted on never materialized, of course. 1981, State Department published uh, a paper called The Communist Interference in El Salvador. And of course, it fully supports everything that I'm uh, that I'm talking about. And of course, it was ripped apart in Congress, ripped apart in the press. Um, back then, the phrase "human rights" was on the on the lips of every every leftist out there. It was an artificial issue. It was it was uh, used by the church to discredit the government. The fact is, is that the archdiocese, Romero, and afterwards, was an important source of information to these NGOs. Um, but, you know, any, any objectivity from the church was gone after Romero was shot. These, uh, Jesuits, uh, fled the country after that and, and reported out of Mexico using, you know, left wing, uh, refugees as their source material. Um, for example, um, the, the propaganda got so bad that the American press claimed that the U.S. had military bases and hundreds of troops in El Salvador. The truth is there were no bases, and there were fewer than 50 American military personnel there. But you had newspapers running reports on non-existent American bases. Uh, the government is responsible for the 10,000 killings that occurred in 1980. But in their own reports, the guerrillas themselves claimed at least 6,000, in which they included non-combatant informers, government authorities, and military. But, you know, these these weren't secret. At least since 1980, this material was, was available. Um, the Communist Party of El Salvador, um, these document caches that were found, and the People's Revolutionary Army in 1981, um, a, whole, a whole group of these were, were captured, and the declassification of Soviet documents clearly mean that these were quite legitimate. Um, so what do you have? Romero is demanding that the army lay down their arms and permit an FMLN victory. El Salvador would have been a Cuban uh, and Soviet satellite. Peasants would not be getting land. That was never the case. He lied or, or was ignorant about the military's uh, land reform program. The fact that the FMLN were killing those from the AFL-CIO and other, other groups that were helping the implementation of this. They barely could function. Peasants who received land were shot. Well, one of the examples of, of, of the, the ridiculous analysis going on here was that as part of the 1992 peace treaty they had to create one of these notorious truth commissions you know they had one in Indonesia the infamous one in South Africa and of course no one seems to have a Spanish name in, in, in any of these these are leftists and Jewish professors around the world and I read this thing and it sounds like it was it was written by a you know green-haired undergraduate and her first paper. Um, oddly enough, they referred to Romero as a Monsignor. He was actually an Archbishop. Um, and you know, they used the most, you know, gruesome language to talk about what the government did to the to the people. This is this is the idi- idiocy of Romero was talking about as if the government was just shooting random people. Uh, this truth commission was pure propaganda. There was another truth commission in Indonesia also against the anti-communist government there that I've analyzed in depth and the only person on planet Earth that, that have done so. Uh, but who's the guy who ran this Truth Commission? A guy by the name of Thomas Bjergenthal, who claimed that he was a Holocaust survivor and a professor at George Washington. He claimed that he was sent to Auschwitz at, at age 10 and somehow survived two years there. Now, another one, uh, and I, and another ridiculous guy, uh, Abe Price, who claimed that he was at Auschwitz and, and survived five full days without water. He said 
that for three years, he didn't see a child under 16 or an adult over than 40 at Auschwitz. By the way, Bergenthal also was involved in the drafting of election standards in Eastern Europe in the 90s. At the same time, he refused to condemn Israeli genocide of the Palestinians, despises nationalism unless it's Israeli. He's financed, of course, by the Gruber Foundation and is on the board of the Holocaust Museum. This, in the eyes of the UN, makes him competent to oversee a detailed research report on the Civil War in El Salvador. Early on in the report, it says only 5% of the killings in the war were done by the left. I want to mention something to you. And it blew my, you know, I, I still can't wrap my brain around it. The, the, the convulsions that this country went through after the Benghazi attack, the, the killing of American personnel, military or otherwise. Well, Yefim Milan did the exact same thing. In this case, there were Marines at the Zona Rosa, was a restaurant in San Salvador, and they were gunned down. Nine civilians were killed as well. Um, silence. There was a uh, American helicopter that uh, made a crash landing. Its crew were executed by the FMLN. Very few people are even aware that that happened. These were embassy personnel, Marines, the embassy personnel uh, that were killed in the Zona Rosa by the communists in the mid-80s. And I don't recall congressional hearings about it. I don't recall it being this, this huge political issue. But it was when these Libyan characters did it. Um, now, there's an attempt to be objective here. But although they claim they only killed 5% of what the, the government did, uh, of extrajudicial killings, they talk about things like the FMLN abducted Duarte's daughter. This is how they fight their civil wars. It took several weeks of negotiation. Um, her name was Inez Guadalupe Duarte. They exchanged her for 22 mayors. Now, wait a minute here. They abducted 22 mayors? It was a lot more than that. They had, and, and remember, the those were old enough to realize, the Viet Cong did the exact same thing in South Vietnam. Killing local mayors, destroying the local power structure, good, bad, or indifferent, was classic you know, communist action. These were elected people. They had 22 mayors in a prison somewhere. Um, and then, you know, they, they gave the daughter, his daughter back, um, and they got these mayors back, and they permitted, um, just over a hundred, uh, FMLN to leave the country. The FMLN also used mines all over the place, indiscriminately. Now, this Truth Commission points that out, and then makes a ridiculous claim that 46 people were killed. They explain, I, 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 don't, I simply don't believe this is true. They explain that in their zones, up in the mountains and elsewhere, they saturated this, the land with mines, and only 46 people were killed. Well, there's a good reason for this kind of utter nonsense, this lack of thought. Um, the one thing that the Truth Commission won't talk about, or the Church of Rome won't talk about, the Jesuits won't talk about, the left won't talk about, the professors won't talk about, is the fact that the left was unpopular. These elections were overseen by the United States, very hostile to the arena party. These elections, which were enforced by a very angry Congress, the Christian Democrats under Duarte polled 43%, and Arena polled 30%. There was a group of coalition of moderate parties, um, won roughly 20. So there was a, you know, plurality. The left were absolutely crushed. And then Duarte, in the second round, won 53.6%. And then Roberto Duobuson run won almost half. Duobuson was allegedly a death squad leader that ordered the killing of Romero. And yet he won half the votes. And in fact, wherever the Arena Party ran, they had a tendency to win, especially at the local level. 
Well, this is why they abducted Mayors. The report even says the FMLN attempted to boycott the elections with transport stoppages. In other words, they blew up the, the uh, rail and communications. Kidnappings and murders and car bombings. This is exactly the same as, as the Viet Cong in South Vietnam. Somehow, abducting 25 mayors in one year isn't an abuse of power. See, because the report assumes that only the state can commit these kind of crimes. Since the FMLN wasn't a state, it can't be liable. But then they admit something else. They admit that, well, let me, let me read it and, and see if you catch it. it you know, they, they try to misdirect the reader, but the fighting that raged up to 12 December cost the lives of over six, uh, 2,000 from both sides and caused material damage amounting to approximately 6 billion colonies. The 1989 offensive was one of the most violent episodes of the war. The guerrilla forces took cover in densely populated areas during the skirmishes. The urban areas were therefore the targets of indiscriminate aerial bombardment. The critical situation in the country bred such violations as the arrest, torture, murder, disappearance of hundreds of non-combatant civilians. It was against this backdrop that the Jesuit priests and two women were murdered. This is a separate murder of Jesuits. Now you caught this, right? Taking cover in densely populated areas, that's the use of human shields. Then, after admitting this, they divert, divert the reader's attention by saying they were, uh, these areas were indiscriminately bombed by government helicopters. Well, it wasn't indiscriminate. They were attacking guerrillas. Using human shields, deliberately taking cover in areas, um, highly populated to try to dissuade the government from taking action. Any actions that the government takes according to international law, is the fault of the guerrillas. So the, the human rights argument really fails in these cases. The FMLN was so rotten um, and so cowardly that the, the normal um, protections for combatants don't apply to them. They, they complain to no end about the killing of these Jesuit leftists running guns for the FMLN. But they also admit uh, the FMLN killed so-called right-wing intellectuals all the time. Anyone who they considered an informer. Anyone they considered not militant enough. Um, this is, you know, so, so by saying 5% of the, uh, of the killings were done by, by, uh, the FMLN and then, and then, um, um, uh, admitting all this. On top of it. Well, if the FMLN is killing right-wing intellectuals and abducting mayors, including the, the president's daughter, then I'm not entirely sure why these Jesuits, Jesuit communists get front page news. And this is, and, and now canonization. Um, well, the point of it all is, the report is as biased as you might expect, but it is now cited internationally and by the Vatican itself as the final word on the topic. It came out in 2001. Um, there's nothing true about it. It healed nothing. It said nothing uh, of any value whatsoever. There were a few admissions in there that I mentioned. Otherwise, it's nothing but propaganda. The man that Jerko uh, canonized in, in Rome was a Marxist. Again, I'll say it again, materialism and the Jesuit order in the post-Vatican II world are perfectly consonant. I had this on very good authority. To be a Jesuit and to be an atheist is extremely common. Now, it is true. It is true that El Salvador was an oligarchy in the late 70s. But of course, oligarchies form when during wartime, because consolidation of, of land holdings occur during periods of instability, for obvious reasons. There were no such thing as death squads. The army wasn't any more brutal than any other army during a civil war. Um, 
The left lied about its intentions and its ideology all the time. These Jesuits, I don't want to, I don't, I don't want to say that the, the church in El Salvador, the Jesuit order, foreign to the country, at these elite universities, running guns and God knows what else, to the FMLN. These were combatants. These were subversives. They simply mirrored the actions of the FMLN uh, in, in how they prosecuted this civil war. But the bizarre thing here is that had the civil war not been going on, military government, uh, or I shouldn't say not going on, but uh, had the civil war not continued in the late 70s, in the very early 80s, the land reform program was very radical. So the violence that the left created with Cuban assistance led to a situation where the land reform program that these same leftists claimed to want couldn't be implemented. And then turn around and said the government is corrupt. The truth of the matter is, is that these Leninist organizations don't believe in communal land holding or yeoman farmers. But when you have a situation where the propaganda is so bad that even the killing of American uh, troops there, uh, uh, embassy personnel, exactly like in Benghazi, don't make headlines, this is a different world here. Now, I've said it many times before. You know I'm no friend of the U.S. military. But when they were fighting communists, or allegedly fighting communists, the military was nothing good can come out of it. They were condemned. The left was burning down ROTC buildings on campuses throughout the late 60s all over the place. But the minute they are fighting for Zionists against whether it be um, uh, Iraq or, or um, possibly Iran, Libya, Syria, all of a sudden now they're superheroes. Nothing has changed. When I was a kid growing up, the left despised the American military. The American military, these guys would never wear their uniforms. In the early 70s, they would never wear their uniforms unless they were on duty. Today, you have a, a, an epidemic of stolen valor. What changed? Well, the nature of the operations changed. The Benghazi issue became a huge political issue. Uh, in, in the elections, 2016 and 1984, four Marines were killed at the Zona Rosa restaurant. It's a deafening silence. I think all told, you had at least 10 American uh, service personnel executed by the FMLN. There were no congressional hearings. There was no teary, uh, uh, teary testimony. Truth is, nothing you read in the Civil War in El Salvador is true. The narrative is infantile. And these, you know, banner republics um, failed miserably wherever they go, wherever they're founded, to do anything of any significance. Land reform takes a military government. But the FMLN, the Leninists, had no interest in this. They didn't care about the people or poverty. They were an agent of foreign power that ended up destroying the country. Every time they tried to contest an election, they lost. Badly. The right wing remained very popular because at least in El Salvador, the program of the military was well known. And these elections were overseen by congressional mandate from the U.S. that were very anti-government. So Romero... A Jesuit, a Marxist, um, was canonized by Francis as a martyr to the faith. Well, he denied the faith. He wanted to turn El Salvador into a gulag, in essence. The minute he said to soldiers, do not obey orders anymore, he became a target. This is in the midst of a brutal civil war where the communists had controlled at least a third of the country. And he tells soldiers to 
Catholic soldiers to disobey orders. God knows what would have happened had he been listened to. This is why these guys were killed. And as soon as this happened, they find the same M16 uh, caches, as well as you know, more, more conventional Soviet weapons, in all of these churches and universities. These weren't clergy, these weren't Catholics. They were communist frauds. And that communist fraud was canonized just a few weeks ago. I don't envy Catholics. Anyway, thank you everyone for listening. I'll talk to you next time. Bye-bye.